the first of a series of interviews we will be conducting fr from local leaders to hear what they have to say about the political climate during the critical election season. On election day, we will be holding a three-hour live broadcast starting at 5 p.m. to pl and plan to bring you exit poll information conducted by Frontier students at the four voting locations throughout the day. Among our guests on election day, we are pleased to have Senate uh, President Stan Rosenberg. Today we have Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Carey. Welcome, Dr. Carey. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Let's start off with question two that you're familiar with. How do you feel about the possibility of charter schools raising the cap? Well, there, there are definitely both, you know, two sides to the issue. I just happen to be on the side that doesn't think it's a good idea, and I hope that there, it's not voted in. A uh, couple of the reasons why uh, have to do with uh, they haven't even fulfilled all the, the schools and the slots that they have in the state already. And if they lift the cap to allow 12 every single year, that, that would, it would just be overwhelming if they actually filled all those schools. But, you know, more, more importantly, um, charter schools, I think, in urban areas might be a little different. My experience with charter schools are in the rural areas and in... Um, you know, regions like ours. The problem with charter schools is when our students come to us, they live in our town and they choose to go to a charter school, we are required, the taxpayers are required to pay their tuition uh, in, these, in the charter schools. Sometimes charter schools, some of them, probably a lot of them, they are a little more um, selective in the students that they choose. As a public school, we take everyone. We're required to take everyone, and we're glad to because we're a community, um, a real, live, um, social, um, a social society in the school. So when you come to a public school where everyone's welcome, that's what society is like. So as a student in a school, in a public school, you're being taught and you're learning with students that make up the communities you're going to live in, all kinds of, all kinds, from, you know, the students who are interested in mechanics to the students who are interested in astrophysics. Uh, we are all um, different and we all offer different things. What happens in a charter school they, if say they're foreign language immersion, all those students going there are interested in one thing and they um, are not required to take, for instance, special education students. They, if they do and they, or they have a student who might have an issue uh, with behaving or assimilating into the, their community, they just send them out. They say we can't, you know, we can't meet their needs. Public schools, we take everyone and we do a really, really fine job of assimilating everyone. And it's hard and it's a struggle, but it's harder when charter students take the money out of our school system, out of our school budget. And so for us here in the western part of the state, in the rural areas, in the smaller districts, I just would have to say it's not the right choice for us. It's, it's just not. And we'd like, to, we'd like to keep our students here. And one of the goals we have for our district, um, a vision that I have, is marketing our district to encourage people not to go to charter schools, to keep them here. Um, we school choice in so many children. We have a wonderful reputation. Frontier Regional has an excellent reputation. We choice in a great many students. And we would like to uh, ensure that 
we're keeping our best and brightest here. We really can't stop students, and we wouldn't, we can't, no, we wouldn't want to, but there's enough students trying, you know, wanting to go to private school, uh, but I would argue with anyone that the education and the preparation that the students in this school get for college and career readiness will rival any, any public or private institution anywhere, whether it's charter or whether it's private. We offer high level AP classes. We have great sports. We, the arts, if you walk down the hallways, our, our building is just beautiful with the creativity of our students. Um, you know, video, uh, the technology is all here. Um, you know, we don't have many rich and famous offspring here from very wealthy people, but what you're getting is a microcosm of what true society is. And I would, uh, I really hope that we can uh, get some PR together to really market our school. So I guess I would say, no, I'm not in favor of, of question two. We. So, um, casinos are a very controversial topic in the state, and question one at, is talking about adding another casino. Do you think that would be beneficial for the state as a whole, or do you think that would cause negative side effects? I, well, to be honest with you, I'd like to see them build the first one, you know, build the one in Springfield, which I think is going to take about a year. I'm not positive. While they're tearing up 91 at the same spot, so I don't know. Uh, I'd like to see what happens there. Years ago, when the lottery started, you know, the scratch tickets and all of that, that money was supposed to go to education. And I'm sure it does, but I would really like to see exactly, I would love to do a research project to see exactly how many millions we're getting from the lottery to go into education. Uh, because we keep hearing that, you know, Everyone's broke, there's a shortfall, you know, cuts everywhere, cuts at the at DESE, cuts all over. Um, I don't know where the profits from the casinos go. I do know they will provide jobs, but I think people will move in to take those jobs, which is, which is good. Uh, they'll build communities and, you know, um, neighborhoods and, but I, I would like to see them finish the big one they have planned in Springfield and see see what that has, you know, what what are the, uh, you know, some of the outcomes of that before we start, you know, putting them everywhere or adding one more. Right. Thank you. Another question on the ballot is concerning the treatment of animals in this state. Being a farm kind of community. How do you think we should interpret this question? My understanding from Aaron who, and you who just explained to me uh, that the law will call for allowing um, uh, animals, critters that are being used for food, the opportunity to be able to stand up and to move around and to uh, have a certain square footage of movement or square inch of movement or, or whatever that is. And I can't imagine anyone being against that. Um, if anyone, and I'm sure you have seen chickens, the way they raise chickens, chicken is very popular now because uh, it's healthier. It's, it's, some literature would suggest that it's healthier than beef and the chickens are just put in cages, they can't even get up on their feet, and they can't move, they can't, you know, they become almost deformed because they're not living a decent life, and then they're just made fat. And so I would say that kind of regulation is, is probably an excellent regulation. I'm not sure how farmers feel about it. It probably will impact the, the cost it takes to raise the animals, but I can only imagine minimally. Um, but I think every every per every piece of life in this in this world, whether you're a plant or you're an animal, I, 
you deserve to stand up, you know, and move. If if that's the way that you're created, you, it's not. Oh, it's just not okay to to cut all that off and expect the quality of the food to be artificially kind of with hormones and pesticides and um, no I would think it would be improving the quality of life for these animals yes okay so the question for on the ballot talks about legalizing marijuana in the state which I know many people have very strong opinions on this do you think this would be beneficial to our community or do you think this would cause some kind of degradation I I don't really have an opinion. I will tell you this. If the marijuana is used for medical purposes, I think that that is legitimate. It's just like opiates being used for medical. I've had a lot of surgery in my life and I've had, you know, painkillers. I've, you know, had, um, uh, you know, anesthesia. You don't do that on a recreational basis, but when you're sick, or you're in pain, it really helps. Um, to ha it helps in the healing process because if you're so stressed out, you're in pain, you're not going to heal as well. Uh, marijuana for recreational purposes, my experience and my research has led me to believe that especially young people who smoke marijuana or eat it or ingest it somehow, um, and they become they use it on a regular basis, it actually kind of stunts their social and emotional growth. They tend to, you know, if they do it for 10 years and they started it like when they were 17, they tend to kind of stay stagnant at that age, that 17 age. They don't go through the, you know, the process of maturing. Right. And uh, we all know that growing up is hard and maturing is hard and becoming an adult is hard. It is. Um, it helps if your high school prepares you for adulthood, and we do. But if you're using marijuana recreationally on a, on a continual basis to the point where you're using it all the time, it really, it really stunts your growth, your curiosity, your... Um, self-discipline, your ability to uh, discern, um, to make proper judgments, to problem solve. I, I would, I'd be very concerned uh, about that. Uh, I know alcohol, you can't drink until you're 21, uh, you know, but that doesn't stop people, you know. Right. Yes. And so marijuana would be the same thing. I, I don't know. Um, I, I just don't know. I mean, one good side would be because it's not illegal, the jails, people, you know, the police wouldn't have to be so, you know, uh, busy. Uh, however, they do also consider it to be a gateway drug. You know, well, I took marijuana and I smoked it for, you know, three years. I didn't have any problem. Let me step it up a little bit. It's almost like I started drinking beers. I, I love beers. You know, let's... Let's get some Jack Daniels and see what happens. So I, I'm, I'm on the, I am not really in favor of recreational marijuana use. You're welcome. Also this November, we will be deciding on who will be our next president. Do you feel this election is more important than elections in the past? <sighs> I, um, the first presidential elec election that I voted in was I believe it was um, 1978, and um, to me, they were all pretty easy. Um, the year Reagan, that was, I'm sorry, 1976, I'm sorry, Reagan was 1980. Um, to me, they were all pretty easy decisions, but then again, I am an Irish girl from Massachusetts and so and I grew up in the 60s and 70s so I've always been hard to believe because I, I've always been a liberal and so it's hard to believe what I'm saying no no marijuana we don't want that no casinos I, I feel like you know 
I think it's because as you grow up and as you mature, you, the wisdom comes, and so you can really look at the long ways down the road. Um, this one more important. Um, I feel like we're making a kind of, um, I just think that we're not being, the country, the reason I want this election to be over is because the country is not being looked at in a positive, you know, overseas, um, people, you know, from other countries. Uh, and, and it's a, it's ironic to me. Um, for instance, I had dinner with the visiting uh, Dutch principal. I, I think you've met him, Hans, and, and so he's here. Um, in his school, they, on the night, of the evening of our elections, they actually have kind of a party at their school, and they eat American food, and they wait for the American election. Can you imagine us doing that for any other country but us? But people are looking to us uh, probably because we're, you know, have been known to be the strongest and the richest, and we get involved and we try to do the right thing, and our democratic uh, process is, is uh, a model for other countries. Um, what's happening in this election is not, I have not in my life seen this. You know, I've seen, you know, a lot of differences, the debates, uh, you know, this sort of thing, but not to the level that we're seeing it. So important, it is important. I just wish that the primaries had been, um, had a little different outcomes. Uh, I'm not sure that the candidates that we chose um, represent all of us. And unfortunately, it becomes one or the other. And, uh, you know, so we always want to look at experience, um, temperament, intelligence, and uh, it is important because as we've seen um, a couple of wrong decisions can lead us down a completely different track. Um, when you look back at Johnson and Vietnam, you know, they were looking at that when Kennedy was still president. Uh, we look at uh, this Iraqi war, you know, um, I think had we had someone else in office, we probably wouldn't have done that. Uh, so now we're looking at uh, terrorism and how we're going to handle it. I think that it's very important uh, who we elect. Uh, and uh, uh, it's just been singular, this, uh, this election cycle's been unusual for many reasons. It's very important though. It's always important. Okay, so although this election has been more about pers the personality of the candidates instead of the issues, what do you think is the most important issue that we need to debate for this election? Definitely terrorism. I think it's on everybody's mind. It's certainly on all of our minds. Um, even in the schools, we worry, could an evildoer come in the building? You know, are we prepared? Do we have enough drills? Uh, uh, people are, you know, things that we would never think happen have happened. Um, and so consequently, I would say the most important thing that we're looking at is definitely terrorism and our, um, you know, our reputation as world, uh, world leaders and uh, working, you know, in concert and collaborating with other world leaders. And we need someone who can do that with some class and some dignity and some intelligence and a good temperament. And that's where I am, but, you know, I think that's the most important thing, though. Definitely is terrorism. We can't do it ourselves. We need to be able to work with others. Thank you. Which issue would you feel in this election would affect 
us here at Frontier, the students, most? Um, I would like, if I, I would say employment, I would say um, enterprise, industry. Uh, we are at Frontier, as um, a lot of the northern uh, New England states, New England, we're losing our population. This school at one time, not so long ago, was a lot bigger than it is now. There were a lot more students here. Um, people are moving, people, young people. Uh, of course, when I was young, there were very large families. You know, I was born part of the baby boom, which was after World War II. We all had big families. Most, a lot of people had big families. There were a lot more of us, but there were jobs. There were jobs all up and down the Connecticut River Valley. There was a lot of uh, industry, manufacturing. Uh, so those jobs have gone away. When we grew up, we had smaller families, my generation. Now this new generation, they're not even, you know, they're waiting a lot longer to get married. They're waiting a lot longer to have children and they're moving away. Uh, there's more industry down in the South and the Southwest. Um, the jobs are in technology now. They're not so much in manufacturing. A lot of that's gone over, you know, overseas. We're uh, an information society. We're not a manufacturing society anymore. And so the jobs are new and different. But I would say that the economy and jobs affects Frontier Regional probably the most. We would like to see the population a little, um, a little more uh, robust and add maybe three to 400 kids to our school. We have the facilities for it. And we have the great resources, the great teachers, you know, it would be great rather than see our population drop. I'd like to see it stabilize and grow some. Okay, so this election season, both um, major party candidates have been said to not show the this, this certain characteristics that a president should possess and that they've engaged in behavior that is that is not a good influence for um, kids of America these days. Do you worry as the superintendent of the school district that um, the students are being negatively influenced by these candidates? I think our whole um, society is being negatively influenced. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have to say that a part of our job in, in helping prepare our youth to face the world, whether it's college or career readiness, is to show you how to behave towards one another. Mm -hmm. And in my job, I, I'm a professional, and I expect to be treated like a professional. I dress like a professional. I do my job like a professional. And so the people I work with, I expect that from them. And so as a student, there's a certain code, too, of behavior that we expect. So we don't expect you to call each other nasty people. We don't, you know, because you think something different or, um, you know, all of this um, digging up of, of behaviors. I mean, I think your, as you, you know, your history, your background really does matter when you're trying to be president of the United States. However, I don't think I need to know you know, about all these affairs and all of these, you know, um, I think it's important for us to know that one of the candidates has not paid taxes in, in 20 years, but do, and, and another candidate, you know, destroy 33,000 emails, but we don't need to know that one of those husbands wasn't, you know, that sort of stuff. So the way they talk to each other and the way they, what's in the media, there's just no, um, there's no, again, there's no dignity, there's no class, there's no uh, kind of, there's no boundaries anymore. You know, I don't know how to say this, but every president has stuff 
you know, that they did before or during the, their time as, as a president. Skeletons in the closet. Yes, everyone. But, you know, when it, but since Bill Clinton, it's just been so, um, nobody, nobody has that kind of, you know, respect to separate that kind of stuff. Um, he did wonderful things as a president, but he also lied, you know, but they put him on the spot and he lied. So I think that there's some details we probably don't need to know, and they're pulling a lot of that in that could cloud um, whether or not the person is really um, a good politician. So there's a school of thought that says, yeah, their behavior reflects what they're thinking and, and how they will act in different situations. And, and there's you know some legitimacy to that, but the way that they just keep going over and over and over again, I mean, um, I tell you what, and I'm not in favor of this particular candidate, but if I had every word that I said uh, replayed back, you know, in the last 15, 20 years, you know, um, in haste or without thinking, if I had it all reported all over the newspapers, so I called, you know, so-and-so overweight, you know, 20 years ago, I think that makes it, it just, it just makes it hard. We're too critical of the things that aren't important. Right. Um, but I do think it is important to know that one of the candidates has 3,500 lawsuits against him herself at this moment. And um, going into a presidency <laughs> with 3,500 lawsuits, is, it might tell you more than, you know, he or she said something 20 years ago that wasn't appropriate. Given the amount of stimulus that is being created for both of the candidates, many people feel like they just aren't going to vote. What would you have to say to them? I think that's, that's, that's a tragedy. That's, that's a sad. I think that kind of thinking is um, self-defeating. And, uh, you know, many times I voted and, and my candidate didn't, didn't get elected, but I still, you have to vote and you have to be um, ever hopeful. But if you, if you don't vote, you can't really, you can't really complain. And, and that's, that's really what's important. Staying home and not voting is not going to help one way or the other. Um, you just have to, to do it and do it with your heart and hope for the best. And, uh, you know, know that the world's not going to end because one or another candidate, you know, got elected. But you, you have to hope that we make the right choice. Okay. So the United States is mainly a two-party system. We have the Republicans and the Democrats, and they go head-to-head. -head. A lot of other democracies have multi-party multi systems. They have lots of other choices to go at. And though we do have smaller other parties, we don't really have another major party to choose from. Do you think more, choi more major choices would have helped this election? You know, I want to go back and talk a little bit about Ralph Nader. And you don't remember him. I mean, I, growing up in the right. 60s and 70s, we, you know, Ralph Nader, he, he really was, um, he, he was a great uh, uh, activist for doing the right thing, for safety, for um, energy, for economics. I mean, he just wanted to do the right thing. And, and he, honest to goodness, was, a, you know, like a Bernie Sanders, or just a really good man with good ideas. And he decided to run uh, as a third candidate, I believe it was when Al Gore and um, uh, W. Bush. And what had happened was he, as a third party candidate, took so many votes that probably would have went to the Democratic Party 
and it was a mess because there was something with the voting in Florida. I don't know. It was very, very, very close. And that would be something I would say, you know, maybe if a couple of more people went out and voted. But a third party candidate, I honestly, I don't know if it'd be better or worse. I do know what happened when Ralph Nader voted because he didn't get enough votes to make a difference but he got enough votes to alter, you know, he didn't make enough votes to get elected himself, but he took enough votes from people from both parties, but it ended up in, in having in George W. Bush. And whether or not that was a good or not, you know, I'm not going to discuss that, but I, I just, I just don't know. I'm on the fence with that. It would depend on who the candidate is. Right. You know, they, of course, yeah, their views and their ideas. Right, right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, I believe you answered all of my questions regarding the local and national politics right now. Aaron, do you have any more questions? All right. well, thank you for being here, Dr. Carey. Please join us on election night where we will have three hours live coverage and also we will be interviewing Senate President Stan Rosenberg.